It's great to see so many people still here. One of our panelists was worried that as you were convening over coffee, what you were really doing was heading for the exit. So it's a good thing that this individual won't be disappointed. I'm Cynthia Watson from the National War College, and I'm delighted to be able to chair this panel this afternoon. Uh, you've heard about the history. You've heard about the raw facts. You've heard one extremely prominent and well-respected analyst give you his views of where we're going and maybe a little hedging on where we might not be going. Uh, but on this panel, we'll try to get a real range on what the individual speaker finds to be the most telling and pressing issue uh, that he or she thinks we need to look into for the future. This is a concluding panel, so I will ask everyone to try to leave some time, adequate time for uh, questions and answers, uh, but I want to make sure that all of the perspectives represented on the panel have the opportunity to give us their views. I'm going to ask that we start with Dr. Chu, who is, you have the biographies, but coming to us from Tsinghua University. Then I will follow with um, Dr. Lai, so that we move from the mainland uh, over to Taiwan, then Alexander Wang, Dr. Wong will be our third speaker, and then concluding will be uh, Bonnie Glazer. So, Dr. Chu. Thank you, the chair. Uh, I'm uh, grateful for uh, uh, Bonnie Glazer and uh, Richard Bruce uh, giving me the opportunity to talk my view about the Taiwan election and the impact on the cross time street relations for the next four years. Uh, first, I see that, uh, as we all know, that the, uh, agree with uh, Douglas Paul's two terms to define uh, mainland reaction to Taiwan election a few days ago, that uh, he used quite calm. Uh, and I uh, read the so far two statements from Taiwan Affairs Office, a statement, uh, the Sunday about the election and the Xinhua News Agency uh, a commentary about election. I think so far those are two only the official reaction uh, I have uh, uh, seen from mainland China. And basically two points, first welcome the election, uh, second and believing and hope that the two cross Taiwan Street uh, relations can continue to be stable, peace, and development. Uh, and uh, yes, I agree with the previous assessment that the mainland feel uh, relaxed uh, about the election. Uh, the reason for the uh, relaxed attitude is that the mainland also wants to see stability of the cross Taiwan Street relations. This is quite agreeable, the same attitude with uh, people uh, inside the Taiwan and uh, here in this country, that is stability. That is the, the central theme that uh, President Hu Jintao produced uh, before and at the 17th Party Congress in 2007 about the central theme of mainland on cross Taiwan Street religion and the peace and the development. Peace and stability are the same meaning, same words. And yes, mainland worry about the DPP uh, 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 projection, uh, especially if PPP won, because uh, if DPP wants let the stability, stability will become a question, peace uh, and stability. And then mainland does not want to see that the instable position in the next four years. And the reason for mainland to welcome and uh, uh, wants the peace and the stability across the street relation is because mainland in the next four years uh, has a full agenda uh, in domestic uh, issues. Uh, like the Beijing leadership, I see that like fully occupied by the internal issues. Uh, economic continued growth, uh, uh, inflation, uh, social inequality issues, corruption, and the public anger on something, and the social political stability 
So it would like to see like the cross time through release and will there will be no, no trouble uh, now and in future. Uh, so I work on international affairs. Uh, my understanding of Beijing's attitude like the that like is a leadership of fully occupied in uh, domestic issues, does not care about others, including the United States. Uh, uh, if you do not bring us trouble, uh, uh, including from Taiwan, uh, so I see that is, uh, that is a general trend, and there is reason uh, why the mainland like to see stability, because the priority is internal. Uh, and the, so I see that the that is basically reaction attitude that the mainland uh, uh, see from the uh, uh, towards the re, uh, the towards the election. And the second, uh, talking about the uh, impact, uh, I see the election will outcome will uh, bring about the another uh, positive impact on cross tensile relations in the future for years. That will. Uh, continue to have the stability and the more progress in social economic issues, like they call the Xing issues. Xing issue is basically a uh, social economic issues. Uh, there have been uh, 16 agreements in the past, uh, most of four years. I think in future, uh, there will be some uh, thing falling up and implement uh, issues like investment protection agreement, uh, law enforcement, and uh, education uh, culture exchange in the future. So there are still some uh, work to be done like the previous speakers are talking about. Uh, so uh, I see that the, the result of the election in Taiwan uh, will, uh, uh, will give the opportunity for two sides to continue their efforts. Uh, from the past four years to improve their social economic context, ties, that is general trend. So that uh, seems to be clear, the impact. Another impact that we have talked a lot is not clear, that is uh, the impact on political security relations between two sides across Taiwan Street in the future. Uh, and we, we had a lot of uh, debate uh, this morning, this afternoon, about the political security talks. Uh, here, I should say that like, uh, most mainland Chinese would want to see it, like, uh, in future, uh, for years, that like, two sides can start the political talks and make agreements uh, on the political issues, uh, can be uh, peaceful or others. Uh, this is very much a general public uh, opinion on mainland side China. Uh, Washington Post yesterday uh, reported that the Taiwan public opinion poll that six percent of Taiwanese are uh, uh, prefer status quo, uh, much more number that like, prefer reunification or something. Uh, yes, this, is, this has been a long time that the poll. I think mainland people understand. But is the public opinion there? But in on mainland China, we also have a public opinion. Uh, and the public opinion is quite in consensus. Five percent is 90 percent of people. And it is quite strong uh, for national reunification, for some movement towards national reunification. So I would like to be uh, clear with myself that this is a uh, strong opinion that the leadership in Beijing uh, understand and have to address it. Uh, but uh, that, that does not mean that uh, it's the government position. I uh, see that the politicians, the government understand uh, both uh, public opinion, demands, and uh, the difficulty in reality, uh, politicians, government. So, uh, in my study, I see government politicians everywhere in the world. Their job is to work between something they want, something their people want, and something they can do in, in the real world. I think it's the same true to my NGO, same, to, same thing true to Hu Jintang and Xi Jinping, and the same thing true to President Obama here. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, 
uh, in the future years, uh, depending on their uh, judgment, their position, like the, the understand the public opinion and the, and the, the reality. The general trend I see in the last uh, four a uh, couple of years, I see mainland leadership government uh, have become has become uh, very very much realistic and practical in cross Taiwan Strait relations, and peace and development is a reflection on that. Uh, so I see later we will continue to be the general trend in the future, but uh, by seeing that. I think if we cannot have political talks uh, in the future, and that means uh, there will be a greater limitation for, for how two sides can in, improve their relations. Because as we already said, that the social economic measures are, most, are mostly exhausted. So how how many of those issues, how much work two sides can do in the four, next four years on social economic issues? Yes, they can implement, implement them. They can follow up on something. But uh, basically, they have uh, reached the agreement that uh, are possible or should to be reached on social economic issues. And then what we, do, we should do in the next four years? And if we don't have political talks and a press on it, I think there will be very much limitation for other specific issues like international space, CBM, CBM security issues, because then we do not have a framework or general principle. And the last point, if there is a political talks, I myself uh, do not know what, what are those political talks will be. Oh, what is political talks? Talk of what? Uh, I have not heard that like, my government, from my limited elimination, that like, my government gave a clear uh, talk. Because political talk, peace call, used to be first the initiated, reached by Taiwan side in the 1990s. It's not the mainland side in this world. And then later, mainland side talk about it. Uh, but now, I don't know. What does that mean, political talks? What is the content of political talks if uh, two sides started? Uh, OK, I think my time is up. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Lai, I neglected to say, is from Taiwan Think Tank. Uh, thank you, Richard and Bonnie, for inviting me here and among these um, <coughs> very prominent speakers. My name is Sai Chong Lai, and I've not been to the United States, well, the DC for about five years. So um, I'm very glad to be back here again, although this is in a circumstances I wish it could be in a better position. <laughs> but uh, well, the reality is like this. And so I uh, thank you for uh, this invitation. And of course, we all know from this morning about the election result. And the reality is that, yes, Ma win the election, and, but uh, uh, com in comparison with what he got in year 2008, uh, the uh, difference between him in, and the opposition uh, down from 2.2 million to 800,000. So it's about 1.4 million votes uh, uh, loss. And also uh, his legislative uh, majority also down from uh, 81 seats to 64 seats. So it's the uh, decrease of 17 seats in legislative yuan. On the other hand, uh, DPP, although did not uh, win as uh, it anticipated or it expected, uh, still uh, was in a better position. Is in a better position now than it was in uh, four years ago. It has increased its vote share uh, and also increased its legislative seats uh, to, uh, about 13 seats. So looking at this, if you believe, or, or anybody, including the President Mind Joe, uh, believe this, this is the mandate that uh, the people, particularly on the 92 consensus, the Taiwanese people already given to him, uh, I have to say that uh, probably this will be a much reduced mandate if it is a mandate. Then, <clears throat> otherwise, and how could you explain about the uh, losing support? 
rather than the increase of support or at, about the maintenance of the support about his uh, 92 consensus and other policies. And also in terms of the political operational point of view, right now we are looking at the uh, uh, mind Zhou still commands a majority in the legislative yuan. However, uh, not only the DPP has 40 seats, but also a party that openly declare uh, want to roll back the ECFA, and also the party uh, at the same time uh, uh, wanted to uh, have a very open platform for Taiwan independence, that the Taiwan Solidarity Union has three seats in the legislative yuan. And the three seats is sort of a magic number that they are able to form a party caucus and, and enter, uh, just like Zhu Yinhan said this morning, about the uh, legislative uh, legislat um, piece of the policy legislation, party to party, inter party negotiation. And if they wanted it, they, put, they can put on hold about a certain policy uh, or a certain piece of legislation uh, for about a month or even three months. So that uh, actually, I think the President Ma ying and his party is facing a stronger opposition and more constraint um, if he wanted to, to push forward certain other things that he wanted to do uh, from now on. And also that, that uh, basically in terms of the uh, cross-trade policy and many of the so-called cross-trade mechanism, that have the, uh, the following impact. First of all, um, when we talk about 92 consensus, uh, associated with it is, adult, is, is, is the uh, 92 mechanism. 92 mechanism, which means that uh, the Taiwan established a uh, uh, straight exchange foundation in negotiation with another its counterpart from China, the uh, uh, rats. Uh, but the Straight Exchange Foundation uh, during that time was only authorized to talk about the functional issue, no political issues. But then we, if you look at the past 16 agreements, some of them actually has crossover to the political issues or the political content about uh, uh, an issue has a political implications. And uh, it, they are able to go over and uh, so the path through, it is precisely because the KMT at that time, with the overwhelming majority in legislative UN, what they are able to do is to put, a, put those uh, agreements, the agreements that the ARAT and the SCF they have uh, signed, then put into the legislative process, but then use the majority to, put, to prevent it from any discussion. And then uh, it is because of the uh, Taiwan legislative UN, they have this bylaw that uh, any, uh, any piece of legislation uh, put into the process and if uh, after like uh, 45 days or three months uh, without any discussion, that means that, that there is no disagreement and it will automatically be passed. All 16 of them, all 16 agreements of them have been passed in this way. So that basically, with the exception of ECFA, now what we have is a past 16 agreements between ARAT and SEF, what they have been signed, are not under or a proper, in my view, the legislative UN debates or discussions. And I think that situation will be changed uh, from now on, with the DPP having 40 seats, and particularly with the Taiwan Solidarity Union, and uh, that three seats. I'm not saying that they are a spoiler, but uh, uh, this is a stronger, um, legislative oppositions. And if they, if the Ma ying president wanted to push forward like it did in the past, then it will be uh, facing a much, much stronger opposition. And I doubt if they're able to do that uh, in this way. Another thing about the, uh, the future uh, development, probably something that is related with uh, the US-Taiwan-China relation is that uh, the US and the China, and also of course with Korea and, and Russia to a certain extent, uh, you see that all are in the process of whether they, they have an election or pr um, leadership transition. And the transition process uh, requires or demanded every government to want to have a, just a stable uh, stabilities, not to inc uh, have any other uh, uh, complexities uh, in the future development. And uh, for China, I think uh, that will basically put into the issue whether uh, they are in a choice that uh, for, for, for Hu Jintao, this. I look at this election as the uh, relief, so I can safely step down. Uh, things now will not be deteriorated uh, when I uh, step out of the office 
or uh, this will increase the hawks within uh, China, demanded that the Mind Zhou should pay back because all the good we have been given to him in the previous four years. So it will be the debate between those two thinkings. And if that, that's uh, something that's going to happen, I believe that window for this uh, will be sometime before August, but after August, uh, any major breakthrough in terms of political negotiation, you know, dialogue, and other things probably won't be able to happen due to the requirement for the uh, uh, sailing through uh, uh, safely uh, in the future uh, environment. And another thing is that that also has been related with what the Dr. Chu Sulong said uh, in terms of the, the future negotiation because uh, as Wang Yi, the Taiwan Affairs Office uh, Director, once said that in the future negotiation will be Yi Zhong Yunnan and the Jin Zhong Youzhen. That is, there will be difficult issues within the uh, easy issues and there will be the uh, a political dimension within the uh, economic negotiation. One of the clear example is about the investment agreement uh, uh, treaty that the mind you government desperately wanted to sign with China before uh, this uh, presidential election, but he did not. All right. And so I think that if issue like those will come in, it is not about a direct political negotiation, but the political contents heavy issues uh, within the economic or what, uh, whatever other cultural and the uh, social uh, agreement they wanted to sign. That will start to occupy the uh, agenda. And I think that will be a real test about how much of the so-called 92 consensus can carry through. So it is not about the 92 consensus. With, with it, we're able to negotiate. Without it, uh, <clears throat> we won't be able to uh, go forward. It is under this mind your government and uh, with Hu Jintao facing those difficult issues, the already existing, the 92 consensus, would that be able to carry the very heavy burden for things to meaningfully going forward? If it is not, for example, if there's a delayed or uh, another uh, very less than de um, wanted uh, the result in terms of invest investment protection agreement between Taiwan and China, how would that uh, reflect to the people in Taiwan? How would that uh, make the people in Taiwan feel about the, uh, the uh, cross-trade relationship we'll be going. So we actually, we are going to enter the very uncharted water uh, in the future. Now, finally, about the global e uh, economic recession, probably uh, some people would like to say uh, uh, coming from the European uh, debt crisis. Uh, Ma's government, during the election process, uh, during the campaign process, uh, once portrayed that, that it is precisely because of European problem that we need China as a cushion for Taiwan's economic development. But uh, we all know that the Chinese is relying on exportation, uh, the particular to the United States and Europe. So the Europe problem will become China's problem, and when China faces problem, how will, how it will react to Taiwan, particularly the uh, goodies that the mind you promised to Taiwan that in terms of ECFA and future negotiation that we are able to extract more goodies from China. Will China be able to deliver that? And if China won't be able to deliver that uh, uh, due to its domestic um, consideration, how would uh, mind you be? Uh, be able to say to the uh, the local Taiwanese community that uh, the uh, uh, cross trade negotiation, or at least uh, something that will be able to come forward, because probably we are going to see is uh, a complicated issues uh, have c uh, political heavy contents and the uh, progress, whether that's with mind you or without mind you, will be stalled or it be uh, slow significantly due to a lot of fa other factors. And uh, I think also with the already existing the so-called 92 mechanism where the uh, SEF uh, was not authorized to talk about political issues. And when we enter this uh, political heavy negotiation, the already existing 92 mechanism that we have for the uh, uh, SEF, would that be able to carry through? And uh, that Taiwan at that time will be facing a very serious challenge that we probably need to reform the whole uh, that is the treaty uh, be, uh, the uh, uh, treaty article for the cross-trade people interchange that is the uh, article within Taiwan and how would that cope with the today's reality if that is the case then uh, with the stronger opposition and in the legislative UN and uh, with a discussion like those open probably we're going to face a very new and uh, you can say prosperous, but also fireworks um, about this because actually in, in the reality, 20 years past 1992, and we're still talking about 92 consensus. To a certain extent, this is, we are in year 2012. So uh, I think some improvement 
or at least some reform to, ref to reflect what is today that is needed. But uh, uh, with the mind Joe's uh, electoral victory and what he faces right now and also international situation at this moment, probably that will be complicated. Uh, if it is can be modeled through, that will be a very pleasant outcome. Thank you. Dr. Wang of Tom Kong University. Where's my? Where's my? Where's the PDF yeah. Oh, okay. How how can I view view full uh, screen? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Richard and Bonnie. Um, this is uh, a little bit before Lunar New Year. I'm, I'm very happy to be back in Washington, D.C. You know why. <laughs> um, uh, this is the Richard you remember four years ago, three days after the uh, election. I presented this uh, slide four years ago. And I say, it won't be mama hoo hoo. <laughs> uh, yeah, maintain uh, a high, high altitude, uh, not to be disrupted by small events, uh, pursue a, a peaceful environment. And, and I checked the list, and I think uh, pretty much, uh, you know, excluding the economic, uh, excluding the political and other sensitive security issues, pretty much in the past four years, those things have been carried out. Uh, not by Taiwan itself, but together uh, between mainland China and Taiwan. And now, um, let's go back to check. Uh, Ray, I promise that your picture is on. <coughs> um, let's uh, look at the first term of Ma in Zhou. Actually, there was some misunderstanding uh, of Taiwan's relations uh, or Taiwan's rapprochement with China. Actually, uh, Ma ying Zhou's guideline was Qin Mei, He Zhong and You Ri. And Qin does not equal to He. Okay? And uh, I specifically put on the picture not only showing you how happy Ray was, but also um, to remind you that uh, Ma ying Zhou, when meeting with Ray, uh, had put a pin on. Uh, on the jacket, that's uh, the flag of the uh, my country and uh, the United States. And that shows that uh, sincerely that Taiwan, when engaging uh, dialogues, negotiation with Beijing, did not put aside of the United States interests. Um, and so was Ma too close to China? Uh, who knows? You know, only Hu Jintao can answer that. And I'm sure their, his answer would be different from a lot of people. And my second term China policy, we spent a lot of time debating and talk about 92 consensus. But uh, we all agree that uh, Taiwan voters in this election decided uh, to maintain the stability, to keep uh, uh, policy consistency in their mind. And uh, if we look at the future agenda uh, in the next four years, I would say that, uh, that Xian Jing Hou Zheng, or economy first and politi politics or political issues later, will remain the dominating guideline in the next four years. Uh, not only because that we have more than two dozens of potential agreements or proposed uh, negotiations, it's already at the plate between Straits Exchange Foundation and the ARATS on the other side. On connecting to the ECFA framework agreement. Um, our negotiation agenda is full and probably cannot be completed in the four years. But also, as uh, Professor Lai mentioned, that Ma Ying-jeou is now facing a stronger opposition in the parliament. 
So he needs to be more careful, uh, more sensitive to the Taiwan uh, uh, public opinion. Uh, how about the political or military uh, negotiations? Uh, it's unlikely because uh, the political agenda is full. Uh, not only uh, Beijing, as uh, Professor Chu remind us, that Beijing will be distracted by domestic issues, um, but also Taiwan is a small state. We need to manage our relationship with two nuclear powers. Uh, so before the agenda in Beijing and in the United States are settled, that we need to be more cautious, at least this year. So if I may use this timeline, uh, to make my point, uh, starting from yesterday that uh, we will have a four month of transitional uh, cabinet, uh, we may have two full cabinet resignation uh, before, between uh, February and uh, May. So in Taiwan itself, as we all know, we are all in capital city. Uh, when government in transition, there are a lot of restrictions in terms of policy decisions. And then we have to wait until the agenda in Beijing and uh, the U.S. election to be settled. And looking into the future, uh, the 2014, um, as uh, many of my friends from DPP suggested, that um, the, the rotation of government uh, uh, will be a normal practice in Taiwan uh, because we are a democracy. And, and the major challenge to KMT rule is 2014, the mayoral elections. If DPP is not in the central government, they will have full time and they will have two full years to get themselves ready to challenge right now three to two very thin margin uh, majority of uh, uh, KMT uh, uh, in the mayoral seats. Uh, and also, after 2014, Ma ying has to be very sensitive to his possible successors and their possible campaign platform and their probability of victory. So in, when engaging in China, Ma cannot put full strength or his personal agenda or willingness ahead, but keep the KMT or the party interests or national interests in his mind. Beyond that, also uh, Ma needs to keep in mind is the strategic um, uh, re-engagement of the United States. I characterize as a trident. It's a multiple, uh, uh, multilateral diplomacy plus uh, trade and a new concept of air-sea battle. So it's political, diplomatic, economic, and military. And so my angel's second term in terms of U.S. policy, I would say it will focus more on bilateral relations. Uh, we talk about the beef, visa waiver program, TIFA, arms sales. They are all very, very difficult issues. But I, I think my angel and his uh, cabinet will spend more energy and time in dealing with this bilateral relations with the United States. Not only that, Ma Ying-jeou has to position his uh, U.S. policy with American Asian strategy in mind. So how to expand the, the, the functions and utilities of ECFA and working for bilateral or mutual commercial and economic interests between Taiwan and the United States is at stake. Um, earlier, we also mentioned a little bit about Taiwan's uh, defense transformation. Ma ying with his campaign pledge, uh, we will soon instate an all-volunteer force program with almost no hope for increase of defense budget. Uh, with the United States re-engaging uh, and uh, re-deployment uh, of U.S. forces in the region and keeping the problems in Northeast Asia, the Korean Peninsula, and South China Sea in mind. So these are all very daunting challenges to the United States. Lastly, I want to throw an idea. It's what I call mini SNED. 
don't be distracted uh, by the term. I'm in no way to suggest that Taiwan will copy a strategic and economic dialogue uh, with the United States. But I think the, the experience that we got, we accumulate in the past four years between Washington and Taipei was that we allowed us to be distracted or confused or conflicted um, in different agencies uh, on different issues. So it would be nice or wise that if we can uh, have an interagency, uh, you know, cabinet to cabinet at an appropriate level, uh, a, a full cabinet dialogue in a quiet, sensible, substantial way uh, to increase and promote the bilateral relations between Washington and Taipei. So conclude my uh, remarks, I would say that in the next four years, Taiwan's relations with China will go slow and Taiwan's relations with the United States will get better. Thank you. Our concluding speaker is Ms. Glazer. Thank you, Cynthia, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming, uh, to Richard for collaboration in this uh, conference today, and especially uh, to the staffs at both the CNAPS and the Freeman Chair, without whom this event uh, would not be possible today. So, First, what are the implications uh, of this election for the United States? This was Taiwan's fifth uh, direct presidential election. Uh, the campaigns and election day itself were, well, um, normal. Some observers said uh, that there was less excitement than in prior elections and that the process was fairly ordinary and mundane. After all, there were no bullets and there was no firing of PRC missiles. The normalcy of this election marks a maturing of Taiwan's democracy, and that is most important, not who was the winner. It was an orderly process in which the presidential candidates presented their views to Taiwan voters who made up their minds about whom to support. Taiwan has demonstrated the strength and vitality of its democracy. A healthy democracy requires a strong opposition and keen electoral competition, and Dr. Tsai Ing-wen brought her party from its nadir after Chen Shui-bian's presidency, won 46% of the vote and 40 seats in the legislative UN. She raised important issues, such as the widening gap between rich and poor, and she conceded defeat gracefully. Opposition parties play a critically important role in democratic societies. They keep the ruling party honest and help to bring better governance. The DPP will continue to play that critically important role in Ma's second term. When Ma won in 2008, President Bush called Taiwan a beacon of democracy to Asia and the world. Although that language was not repeated by the Obama administration in its congratulatory message, it nevertheless remains true today. Taiwan especially represents a model for the people of mainland China to aspire to. Mainland Chinese tourists and students in Taiwan witnessed the campaign firsthand. Even larger numbers watched the presidential debates and the election results live via satellite TV. The election was the subject of postings in internet forums and on Chinese blogs. In years past, many mainlanders described Taiwan's election as chaotic and violent and viewed Taiwan's democracy as false or a negative model for China. This election has altered those views fundamentally. Many PRC citizens observe this election with respect and envy. One blogger wrote, and I quote, this is a first step in civil rights. This is a way we can learn how national leadership should be elected. Only when state leaders are elected via a democratic process can China become a democracy. Leaders produced via other methods are only dictators under a fake skin of democracy, end quote. Ma's re-election for a second term will ensure continued stability and predictability in cross-strait relations, which is critical for American interests. 
Ma has pledged to continue his three no's policy, no unification, no independence, no use of force. And therefore, the United States will not have to worry about the reemergence of cross-strait straight tensions or the implications of reunification. The US will continue to support Ma's pragmatic approach to dealing with Beijing. There will not likely be pressure on Ma to move more slowly or more quickly in promoting better cross-strait relations. The US will leave it up to Taiwan to decide. Washington will expect to be consulted as a friend and quasi-ally with important interests at stake. US policy toward Taiwan will likely continue to be guided by the view that only a secure and confident Taiwan will negotiate with Beijing. US ties with Taiwan must, therefore, remain strong. In Ma's second term, whether President Obama remains in office or is replaced by a Republican, it is likely that US arms sales to Taiwan will continue. The question is, what will be sold? The Obama administration has approved $13 billion in weapons sales so far, but has yet to sell new weapon systems that were not previously approved by the Bush administration. President Ma's request to purchase F-16CDs remains a front burner issue. Hopefully, TIFA talks will resume and the U.S.-Taiwan economic relationship will be strengthened. The U.S. will be disadvantaged if it does not negotiate an FTA with Taiwan. Taipei is now in trade talks with Singapore, and New Zealand, India, Japan, Australia, and the, and the European Union have all signaled a willingness to open bilateral trade negotiations. Let me turn to the implications of the election for U.S.-China relations and cross-strait relations. In the past few months, Beijing has not loudly opposed the many measures that the Obama administration took to bolster ties with Taiwan, including visits to the island by several senior U.S. officials. Undoubtedly, China's reserved response was due to its belief that such steps would help Ma to get reelected, which was Beijing's preferred outcome. Now that the elections are over and Ma has won, China is likely to resume pressure on the U.S. to curtail weapon sales to Taiwan. China's hopes of achieving this goal have been buoyed by discussions in the U.S. to rethink U.S. policy toward Taiwan. Taiwan will therefore remain an area of friction in U.S.-China relations. How much friction will depend on U.S. policy decisions and China's reaction to them. Ma's re-election presents opportunities for further progress in cross-strait relations, but problems are inevitable and should be anticipated. The mainland may be satisfied with the current agenda until after the 18th Party Congress, but subsequently greater impatience can be expected. Some on the mainland say that Ma's first term was weighted in favor of concessions by Beijing to Taipei and called for the second term to be payback time in which more benefits are accrued by the mainland. Whether this sentiment is translated into the mainland's policy approach to Taiwan remains to be seen, but it is worth watching. Beijing will conclude from Ma's victory that its policy of peaceful development has been a success. Discussion of the potential negative impact on whose legacy of a DPP win and resulting pressure on Chinese leaders to adopt a tougher policy toward Taiwan will now cease. With Ma winning by a bigger margin than expected, Beijing will become more confident in its efforts to win hearts and minds in Taiwan by means of economic favors. At the same time, however, the strong comeback by the DPP will ensure that mainland China will not be overconfident. Beijing will wisely not rule out a DPP victory in 2016, and hopefully over the course of the next four years, dialogue between the DPP and the mainland will expand. In the economic sphere, the easy things have been done between Taiwan and the mainland, and the more difficult things are yet to be addressed. Further trade liberalization under ECFA will be hard. Negotiation of, of a bilateral investment protection treaty will also be challenging. In the political realm, there's a possibility that Beijing will pressure Ma to adopt a definition of one China that is closer to the one China principle that is espoused by the mainland. China may also seek to persuade Ma to open talks on a peace accord, and this could become a major source of disagreement. The negative response of Taiwan's citizens to Ma's raising this issue during the campaign 
has likely made the president more cautious. Ma will undoubtedly continue to press Beijing to enable Taiwan to expand its international space and sign FTA-type agreements with other countries. He will also continue to call for a reduction in the military threat to Taiwan. In recent years, there has been little, if any, discussion on the mainland about adjusting its military deployments. I'm personally doubtful that mainland China will make any moves to do so in part because the Chinese remain wary of the return to power by the DPP, now possibly in 2016. Military CBMs could be negotiated between the two sides of the strait. CBMs that reduce the possibility of a surprise attack, increase predictability, and reduce the chance of accidents would serve Taiwan's interests. A potential meeting between Ma and China's next top leader, Xi Jinping, could take place if Beijing support, supports Ma's attendance at APEC. It is not likely, in my view, that Ma will visit the mainland because Beijing would not agree to host him as the ROC's president. In sum, the US-China-Taiwan triangular relationship can be expected to remain basically stable. Problems will invariably arise in all three sets of relationships, but are likely to be manageable. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank each of the panelists for remaining true to the time, and I'd like to open up. We have 25 minutes, roughly, for questions. Please give your identification and be as succinct as possible. Chris. Wait for the microphone, Chris. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Uh, uh, thank you so much, all, all of you, for talking about the economic component so much, because it's the other thing I try to write about, especially on TPP. Um, I'd like to ask uh, all of the participants, and perhaps even Ray Burkhardt, who's trying very carefully not to look at me, uh, so he just <laughs> um, is it realistic to talk about Taiwan and TPP from a, num a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 vantage points. Uh, China, at the moment at least, seems to see TPP as yet another uh, sort of element of what it sees as a U.S. containment policy. Uh, it, it, does that in itself make TPP sort of a, a hot thing to even talk about? Uh, that it's gonna, they're going to see, see that as, as a problem? Or would it be uh, unrealistic to say, no, uh, actually to get the U.S. and Taiwan uh, talking about how Taiwan might get into TPP could help show the Chinese, given ECFA, that uh, TPP is not aimed at China or against China, but it's something that China could also look at. Uh, and then from you know the the, the either or possibility uh, again and maybe this is where Ray can help us out. Um, uh, what does need to be done so that it would be realistic to talk about Taiwan joining into TPP, or is that just one of those things that you know we'd all like to talk about, but no no way. Thank you. I'll just comment uh, very briefly. Uh, Chris, I think that perhaps um, we sh need to make a distinction in this case between how scholars in, uh, on mainland China view TPP and how the Chinese government view, view this, particularly regarding uh, the intentions of U.S. policy. I think it, that U.S. officials at the White House have made uh, perfectly clear that TPP is not intended to exclude anybody, that it is open uh, to all countries and I believe to all economies. I think that is a signal to Taiwan as well. Uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Michael Froman at the White House who made the statement that TPP is not something that you get invited to. It is something you aspire to join. And I believe that in private discussions, uh, this is likely to be reinforced in messages to China. It would undoubtedly be beneficial to the United States, to Taiwan, to the rest of the region if China actually were to join TPP and conform to all of the high standards that are involved in this, uh, that will be included in the, uh, 
in, in the uh, FTA agreement eventually. Um, having China not be part of the T TPP in the long run, um, I really don't think would be uh, beneficial. So I agree with you that there might be some scholars who see it that way, uh, but I don't think that that's the way the Chinese government sees it. Thank you. Quick response, Chris. Uh, I think from the uh, standpoint of Taiwan, um, you know, Taiwan has long feared that uh, we'll be uh, marginalized economically. Um, and uh, ECFA was one approach, or one solution. Uh, but but uh, joining the TPP is, is a long-term goal. As uh, President Ma Ying-jeou in his uh, press statement said that uh, in the next 10 years, we will try to work hard to meet the high criteria that TPP requires. But all these efforts, uh, point number one, is to put Taiwan or, or help Taiwan to escape from this possible economic marginalization. Number two, I think uh, the, the biggest obstacle, if we sit in Taipei, the biggest obstacle is not Beijing. <laughs> it's our domestic support. Uh, you know, uh, w the leadership, or, or President Ma ying in the next several years, would have to you know, engage uh, in conversation and discussions, not only with uh, oppositions, but also with uh, different sectors, the agricultural, the service industry, the manufacturer. It's a, it's a daunting obstacle for Taiwan to meet the criteria before we think of whether we wanted to join something that opposed China or antagonized China. Uh, I agree with Bonnie. Uh, that there are different views in China about the TPP. Yes, if you read the Global Time or some scholars, uh, they tend to interpret everything the U.S. does in Asia to contain China, uh, including uh, TPP. But the official and the mainstream scholarship view, uh, and including my view, uh, basically see TPP as competition that the U.S. has with China, not a containment. A competition for interests, for influence, for ties uh, in Asia Pacific. And uh, I see that so far, most Chinese do not worry too much about TPP. First, it's going to be a long-term process uh, for negotiation. Uh, second, the, the, as, uh, 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 as Dr. Huang said, the criteria is too high. Uh, for even for Japan to meet. Third, I think uh, most Chinese tend to have confidence that uh, nothing is going to likely to replace that like, we are largest trade partner and the market for most Asian economics, uh, whether there's a TPP or not in future. Yeah, it seems everybody's responding, so I have to do the work the same. <laughs> Um, basically, from the, adding to what the Alexandra's point, I think um, Taiwan signed the uh, ECFA with China. If China rejected Taiwan to participate in TP negotiation, uh, showing anything like this, that will be demonstrating to Taiwan that uh, uh, China only allowed the Taiwan to be on an economic part of China, but uh, not to let Taiwan to engage with the rest of the world economy. And that would be not good, and not only to the people in Taiwan, but also uh, it would reduce the support for Ma ying in terms of his uh, popularity in Taiwan. Another point about the, um, the uh, complexity or the difficulty in the uh, TP negotiation. You look at the Taiwan economic negotiation with New Zealand, with the Singapore, well, that, that probably will be a little bit easier. But with the India, that's going to be a difficult one. And because India specifically raised that it is not just about the goods, but also the movement of people and other, it had to be comprehensive. So the TPP negotiation, Taiwan uh, encountered difficulty, will also uh, be the one that Taiwan encountered difficulty in negotiation with India and other countries. And I think uh, that is not whether Taiwan is ready or not, but uh, it's a political will. And if Taiwan we really like to push over, in particularly that the DPP already uh, ring its support for the TPP. So I do not think that the, in this issue, the difficulty is really that big because that is the one that really has endured the so-called Taiwan consensus. Thank you. Ray Burkhart, would you like to comment? <laughs> I don't want Chris to think I'm ducking him, so yeah. Um, I mean, you, people have said it all. Uh, TPP is a serious, uh, broad 
deep trade agreement, very unlike the kind of trade agreements that have been signed recently within Asia, particularly very unlike the China ASEAN agreement, um, also very unlike ECFA. It's not one of these sort of, uh, in other words, it's not one of these half-baked early harvest kind of trade agreements. It's a serious agreement that gets into service areas, the whole, the whole broad range. The Taiwan economy, ha Taiwan has been uh, fairly protectionist. It remains very protectionist. Um, it's not, uh, Taiwan officials have made public, made clear publicly and privately that, the, that Taiwan is not ready for a, a TPP kind of agreement. But for Taiwan to aspire to it and to move in that direction would be certainly very welcome by the United States. Um, and the same thing can be said about China. One of the clear things about TPP was very, very much emphasized during the APEC meetings in November is that, TP, that one of the aims of TPP, at least from the United States' point of view, is to have a trade agreement which does not give state-owned enterprises um, a special, special rights, and which, uh, and which uh, basically um, uh, forces uh, state-owned enterprises to compete on equal terms with private companies. Um, that's going to be very tough for, for Vietnam in terms of TPP negotiations. It would be really tough for China. Um, almost unimaginable, frankly, at this point. Eric? Vaden Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. Alex, I liked your strategic uh, trident for all sorts of reasons. Um, but uh, you mentioned TPP. When you said the multilateral diplomacy, what countries were you primarily talking about in multilateral there? And I missed the third prong of the trident, so remind me of that. Uh, Dr. Lai, uh, was the uh, tension, residual tension over the uh, Chen Shui Bian era for the DPP and the U.S. Uh, considered a significant factor in this election? And is the DPP going to continue to do things to try to build a better relationship with the U.S. government while it's not in power? Uh, very shortly, uh, when I make the case of strategic trident, basically I look at the three elements that in the past two or three years that the United States has been done. Uh, the multilateral diplomacy means the more proactive participation of the United States in Asia-Pacific regional fora. Uh, you know, from uh, Secretary Clinton's efforts, from APEC, from ARF um, and East Asia Summit, all the way to uh, even initiative to the uh, uh, Pacific Islands. I mean, I, I categorize those as multilateral diplomacy. And the third element was air-sea battle concept. Okay, so it's a combination of uh, diplomatic, economic, and uh, military re-engagement of the United States in the region. Um, actually, I don't quite understand this question. That is, uh, the uh, tension between DPP and the U.S. government during the Chen Bian era, uh, how will DPP will be able to readdress that, uh, in particular right now? And uh, uh, I think if you look at the Tsai Ing-wen and her leadership uh, during those four years, that uh, she um, particularly d does not want to uh, put the so-called the identity issue and the unification versus the independence issue up front. And uh, I think it is important to note that uh, uh, from the campaign, I mean, this is uh, way before when she entered the primary within the DPP, all the way until today, I believe, that in the campaign process, she refused to call China by name. She ma never made any bad statements referring to China. It's always something that we can discuss, and she even offered that we are willing to talk about any things with no precondition. With no precondition, which means that Taiwan will not attach any condition China has to abide by. And if I'm going to, to be more specific, China does not even have to withdraw these missiles. China does not have to uh, renounce its so-called One China Principle. And China does not have to do anything. We are willing to talk anytime, any place, anywhere. 
So that is what the Taiwan actually pledged. And uh, if you look at the 10-year platform, that is still in the uh, uh, DPP's uh, part of Taiwan's process. Uh, one of the 10-year platform in the so-called core idea, in which uh, that is the article about how to reach the social consensus within a democracy. And uh, if you look at that, the, uh, there are distinct, in terms of language, differences uh, with what the uh, Taiwan uh, Future Resolution is. Because in uh, the resolution about Taiwan future in 1999, which talks about Taiwan's current name, so the current name is Republic of China, but uh, in Taiwan's, that is Taiwan is Republic of China. So that's one uh, first differences. And second differences is that the uh, name changes in the uh, Taiwan resolution uh, or any other change of this uh, status quo has to be uh, forced, uh, has to be confronted with uh, referendum process. but. In this 10-year platform, particularly in that part, that it uh, particularly said use the language that democratic process. So it dropped the word about referendum and uh, using democratic process instead. So all those are just uh, signify the kind of the changes and also sensitivity that she had in terms of lowering down the uh, possible tension across the street. But unfortunately, that uh, when Tsai mentioned those things, and when Tsai uh, made those gestures, uh, the, uh, what, uh, she was met uh, by the, uh, particularly later on, the Chinese official calling her by name and taking the, uh, 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 her position that the ROC is, uh, Taiwan is, is ROC as, that's a disguised uh, Taiwan independence uh, strategy. Or uh, calling Tsai Ing-wen by name that uh, uh, she is actually trying to prevent the, um, uh, the, uh, the three links by adopting the so-called ministry links, which I think that's unfortunate because uh, the transformation process within DP also that has been symbolized uh, by Tsai during this time is that if you have uh, a positive uh, gestures, whether by the United States or by uh, China, then the, uh, uh, the kind of transformation within DP will be much easier. So that's, and then we are left with this, that when the deep Tsai is about to resign from leadership, uh, how the 10-year platform, would that just cease to exist because she resigned from the leadership or that will continue to stay there? So that's going to be another question. Thank you. The gentleman at the third table back on the left, from on my left. Hi, uh, my name is Raymond and I'm from the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, it seems to me that the midterm prognosis seems to be uh, cautiously optimistic, but a lot of that is obviously contingent on Ma having won the election. I was just wondering to, if we could explore a little more the, the possibility of uh, not so much a DPP victory, but necessarily a DPP uh, communication with the Communist Party or the Chinese government. Uh, specifically, it seems that from the perspective of a lot of DPP folks, in s including the perspective we just heard, uh, that DPP has gone through a very intense process of transformation and it's moderated itself, but still China is deeply suspicious uh, fr from its perspective of what the DPP's actual goals are and what its agenda is. So in that light, do you see uh, it necessary for the DPP to go through an even more uh, significant and painful process of renewal? Uh, to moderate its demands, to come closer to a different understanding of sovereignty? What is the likelihood of that actually happening? And if that process were to fail, uh, what would the implications uh, for Taiwan's democracy, uh, for cross-strait rapprochement be? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, DPP CCP uh, dialogue, uh, I think that has uh, happened um, particularly last year, uh, later half of last year, that has gone to uh, several degrees of uh, intensity. That is, uh, we, s we know that uh, the DPP New Frontier Foundation, uh, one of the uh, uh, deputy director for the international affairs, uh, she, uh, no, he, uh, went over to Shanghai on November and along with another person uh, for some discussions. 
Uh, I'm not going to reveal what the content discussion because I don't know. Uh, I myself also engage in several contact with not just a scholar but also with officials. But unfortunately, some of the reports that we reported back and in the Chinese public statement are demonstrating two very different themes that uh, the possibility about uh, the 92 consensus in which when we look at it, uh, the uh, DPP's position has moderated to a certain degree that even the DPP uh, position on 92 consensus that uh, 92 really happened something. So we are willing to talk um, based on what, uh, what the result of 92 negotiation. And, but the second fact about the 92 consensus is that the uh, Chinese position one, of one China principle is not publicly endorsed by the KMT. But also KMT position about one China different interpretation is also not accepted by China. And the third point is that about the facts, the uh, uh, 92 consensus uh, from 1993 all the way to 1998, that despite the Chinese repeated refusal and the denial about the one China different interpretation, in 1998, uh, both sides are still able to uh, get going for the second Guang negotiation, the Guang talk. And from year 2000 over, all the way to year 2008, uh, with the pragmatism there, uh, the, uh, this under DPP's rule, that both sides are able to finalize the three links, uh, first from the ministry links and then to the air transportation links uh, on the festivity, uh, uh, charter flight, and all those things. So the issue is that uh, on DPP's position that is that uh, the uh, uh, non-acceptance about the so-called 92 consensus is based on what is, what is actually there. But uh, the DPP was uh, believing when we look, when DPP was looking at the uh, Hu Jintao's three uh, opinions regarding the 92 consensus, they found a um, tremendous amount of similarity they actually can engage upon. So those are the, uh, uh, the issue, because I'm just taking this uh, occasion to talk about the uh, uh, one part of the examples about how the difference between both sides in terms of nano consensus. But uh, I think me, DPP, to a certain extent, misjudge about how the 92 consensus and all those is particularly signified to Hu Jintao himself, because it seems that Hu Jintao, he is the one that personally take these things as, uh, and take the political risk within his party to really going forward uh, in order to, uh, in his management about the Taiwan issue. And uh, rejecting this, sort of like a put a public uh, a slap in his face that uh, the Hu Jintao would never accept. And I think that kind of the underestimate about the, how this personally means to Hu Jintao is some, some of the lesson that DP needs to learn. But how would that mean to Xi Jinping and others? Dr. I think that would be the open things. Thank you. Thank you. Dong Hui Yu with the China Review News Agency. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Chu Shulong. And uh, I remember you wrote an article in Global Times a couple years ago arguing that uh, China doesn't need to uh, focus too much on the U.S.-China relations or take the U.S.-China relations too seriously. And how would you view the U.S. factor in the further cross-trade negotiation regarding the political and security issue. And this question also for uh, Mrs. Bonnie. And uh, you mentioned that the U.S. won't push the developments of cross relations uh, faster or slower. Do you think the U.S. Uh, would be really happy to see a closer cross trade uh, tie? And also, the, uh, what the, uh, the possibilities of reaching the peace uh, accord although the opportunity would be very small, what role the U.S. will play in this process? Thank you. Uh, my, my argument uh, from then uh, till today is basically you look at the national uh, ground strategy upon will China uh, argue China become much more internal oriented. Uh, I think like the general trend uh, in whole China, uh, and that China will be continued. I think that China is good 
for Chinese uh, foreign policy, foreign religion. Uh, but that does not mean uh, USA is no longer important to China, including Taiwan Institute religion. I uh, should say in the past 10, more than 10 years, including Bush, eight years, Obama, uh, near four years, you have, US has played a very positive, stabilized role in cross Taiwan Institute of religion. I think uh, the uh, relatively peace, stability, uh, cross Taiwan Institute religion in recent years has a lot of uh, uh, contribution from the U.S. side. Will the United States be happy to see improved cross-strait relations? Um, absolutely. I think that has been quite clearly stated uh, by uh, the, this administration and also by George W. Bush administration. Many people in China seem to not want to believe this. <laughs> I was... I was listening um, to a CCTV uh, interview with a Chinese scholar the other day after the elections, and he predicted the United States is going to ensure that it slows down the progress in cross-strait uh, relations. I really think this is nonsense. Uh, the United States has repeatedly said that what we care about is the process. We want differences solved uh, peacefully and uh, without any coercion uh, or an undue pressure uh, by uh, the mainland on Taiwan. Um, it is the, the, the people uh, on, on Taiwan uh, that should have a say in, in the outcome. Uh, I see absolutely no concerns that the U.S. has about improved cross-strait relations. I don't think privately or publicly that we have conveyed any concerns to Ma Yingzhou about his policies. Um, but if anybody here from the U.S. government, there are several of you want to disagree with that, <laughs> uh, feel free. Uh, what is the U.S. role in a peace accord? Um, I would say none unless, the United, unless uh, Taiwan and mainland China want the United States to play uh, some role. I don't believe that you will see any active effort by the administration uh, to encourage or discourage such uh, talks. If that's something that Taiwan and the mainland agree that they want to talk about, um, I think we will, we will certainly be uh, supportive. Uh, it, but it's, I think that Taiwan probably would like the United States um, to play some role, for example, in a, I've talked with people in Taiwan about uh, confidence building measures in the military sphere, and many people have said they would like the U.S. to play a role of guarantor. Um, again, that's, unless it's something that the mainland wants, I think that the United States would not do that, though it might be important for a third uh, country or several countries uh, to play that role. Thank you. We have reached the end of our appointed time. I'd like to ask you to uh, join me in giving this panel a round of applause. <laughs> and let us turn it over to our conveners for any final comments. <laughs> Well, I just want to thank you all uh, for coming. Very much appreciate the interest um, and your your questions and uh, and and uh, your your engagement on this issue. And we will continue to uh, hold events in the future um, and publish in the future. We will have this this event on our respective websites, both Brookings and CSIS, and we will also be posting with the. Uh, agreement of the speakers today, uh, either the text of their presentations or the PowerPoints. Thank you very much. <laughs>